It's 4 p.m. on Tuesday, October 7th here in Korea, live from Seoul. I'm Na Hyun Kyung. We begin with the upcoming inter-Korean high-level talks. Now, watchers say Pyongyang will be asking Seoul to lift sanctions that were imposed on the regime in 2010. Our Unification Ministry correspondent Hwang Sung-hee has the first story. When officials from the North and South sit down for talks in the coming weeks, the easing of sanctions imposed by Seoul four years ago will be a top priority for North Korea. The sanctions, instituted in response to the North's sinking of a South Korean warship, ban nearly all inter-Korean economic activities except those within the Kaesong industrial complex. Seoul says Pyongyang must assume responsibility for its involvement in the 2010 incident. For the May 24th, sanctions to be lifted. Our stance is that North Korea must first take responsible steps that can be fully accepted by the South Korean public. Considering North Korea had been raking in 3 billion U.S. dollars annually from cross-border trade before the sanctions, its losses amount to at least 15 billion dollars. In that time, Pyongyang's dependence on China has increased, its trade with Beijing standing at around 6.5 billion dollars last year. Addressing concerns that the sanctions are standing in the way of improving inter-Korean ties, President Park Geun-hye has shown some flexibility. South Korean companies are taking part in a fresh trilateral project with Russia and North Korea, building a railway running from the North Korean port of Najin to the Russian town of Hassan. But before South Korea lifts any sanctions, it will also have to take into consideration the handful of international sanctions that have been slapped on Pyongyang over the years. Hwang sang Arirang News. A North Korean patrol boat, meanwhile, crossed south of the de facto maritime border in the West to Sea earlier in the day, exchanging fire with the South Korean military. Now, although it's not rare to see this type of incursion by North Korea, it is sending mixed signals as it comes just a few days after three top North Korean officials made a surprise visit to Seoul. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff says the South Korean military issued warning messages and fired off warning shots. The North Korean vessel returned fire but turned back a short time later. Over at the National Assembly, the annual parliamentary audit began today, but there are concerns that legislators are underprepared because of the months-long political standoff over the contentious ferry bill. Shim young has more. Twelve of 16 parliamentary standing committees got started with their audits of government offices this Tuesday. The Foreign Affairs Committee in its questioning urged the government to prepare thoroughly for high-level talks with North Korea that are slated to take place in the coming weeks. Regarding the possible lifting of economic sanctions that were imposed on Pyongyang after its attack on the South Korean warship Chanan in 2010, the committee called on the government to be flexible for the sake of bettering cross-border relations. The Defense Committee focused on the possible deployment of an American anti-missile defense shield in the South to deter ballistic missile threats from North Korea. The Public Administration Committee criticized the government's botched initial response to the deadly Seoul Ferry tragedy and asked whether dismantling the Korea Coast Guard and the National Emergency Management Agency was an appropriate follow-up measure. But the lack of preparation caused by the month-long political standoff has raised doubts about whether the audit will fulfill its purpose. The parliamentary audit should not be seen as political theater. Lawmakers should refrain from scolding and humiliating witnesses. Fifty-three government agencies are subject to inspection today, but some standing committees are already facing problems with absent witnesses and lack of cooperation from the ruling Senri party. In Korea, a parliamentary audit of the government takes place every year. The ruling party usually puts more emphasis on recommending improvements to the government offices that are being audited, while the main opposition party usually focuses more on pointing out the missteps of the incumbent government. Jim young Adirang News.
It's an expected but still disappointing profit estimate. Samsung Electronics says its third quarter operating profit is expected to drop about 60 percent on year. Analysts warn that Samsung will have to overhaul its smartphone design portfolio if it wants to make up ground, especially in the U.S. market. Kim ji reports. Samsung Electronics posted its worst earnings in three years for the July to September period, and they're not expected to recover anytime soon. In a provisional report released ahead of official third quarter figures due around the end of the month, the Korean company says operating profits have likely dropped to 3.8 billion U.S. dollars. That's a near 60 percent drop from the same period last year. This is also 8 percent lower than the estimated average of 24 low local securities firms. Samsung also said it'll likely post third quarter sales of $44 billion, down more than 20 percent from the same period last year. Industry analysts cited falling sales in its high-end smartphones as the main factor, such as the Galaxy S5, which was released last April, and its Galaxy Note 4 phablet released last month. Eroding profits in its mobile unit has in turn affected other Samsung units that supply things like displays and processor chips. Analysts say the start performer was the chip business, which was expected to account for nearly half the third quarter profit. The rise of competitors in China is seen as a main factor behind Samsung's decline in global market share. The popularity of Apple's iPhone 6 and 6 Plus are also believed to have had an impact as consumers held back to wait for the new models, which were released last month. Due to this, a pickup in the fourth quarter is unlikely as saturation in the high-end smartphone market is further driving down unit prices of Samsung smartphones while increasing the company's marketing expenses. Samsung Samsung says it's preparing new smartphone lineups featuring new materials and innovative designs. It also developed new mid to low end devices to help it compete in the ever evolving market. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Korea's exports in the information, communications and technology sector in the meantime hit an 11-month high in September on the back of strong sales of display panels, computer devices and tablet PCs. Government data shows last month's outbound shipments of ICT products standing at 15.4 billion U.S. dollars, up 9 percent from a year earlier. In particular, exports of semiconductors hit an all-time high of nearly 6 billion dollars. Korea's handset exports were down 5 percent, however, with the launch of Apple's latest iPhone 6 models and the continued rise of Chinese manufacturers like Xiaomi. It's not news that Korean parents are willing to spend some big money on their children's English education, but here's new data that hammers home the point. A new study shows parents with children in elementary school or younger spend an average of 150 U.S. dollars a month on private English education. That's more than twice as much than they do on Korean education. Now, this is according to a survey conducted by an English tutoring institute last month on more than 500 parents. The respondents cited the growing importance of English in society and a lack of public English education as the reasons for their increased spending. Now on to one type of business facing tough competition in Korea. With convenience stores on virtually every corner, they are now trying to think outside the box to attract attract rather customers. Our Kim Min-ji takes us through some of their more unconventional services. Convenience stores in Korea are pushing to become more convenient than ever, evolving into so-called living stores that cater to the everyday needs of consumers. The number of convenience stores has nearly doubled from just four years ago. This translates into roughly one convenience store per 2,000 people and it's growing to become a $12 billion industry this year. But with quantitative growth approaching its peak, convenience stores are now seeking new sources of profit by offering a new range of products and customizing stores to meet the individual needs of customers. 7-Eleven offers diverse products depending on store locations. In this store, we sell flowers and have imported a French underwear brand. We're also planning to offer more products that meet the needs of single-person households. 
Non-food products now make up about 17 percent of 7-Eleven sales, and the plan is to boost that figure to 20 percent next year. GS25, another popular convenience store, is offering a lineup of tech goods from cell phones and televisions to water purifiers. And some take it to another level by offering space to enjoy a cup of coffee or hold meetings. I didn't know these rooms existed. I hope to use one in the future with my friends when I do team assignments. Customers can reserve these rooms at just $1 per hour along with free Wi-Fi access, printing facilities and laptop rentals. We created this space with the purpose of attracting more customers by offering convenience. People visit our store not just to buy food, but to spend time. By shifting focus from their traditional money makers like instant foods towards new goods and services, convenience stores are striving to be more than just a quick stop shop. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. The Ebola scare has now reached Europe with the report of a first infection outside of West Africa. The development has the World Health Organization upping global awareness on the deadly virus. Shin se has this next report. A Spanish nurse has become the first person to contract the Ebola virus outside West Africa in the current outbreak. Spain's health minister confirmed Monday that the woman, described as sanitary technician, had treated two Ebola patients in Madrid who later died. She has been transferred to a hospital in Madrid for treatment, and 30 healthcare workers who came into contact with her will remain under observation for three weeks. In the United States, the Obama administration is working on bolstering its defenses against Ebola. You know, we're also going to be working on protocols uh, uh, to do additional uh, passenger screening both at the source and here in the United States. Uh, all of these things make me confident that here in the United States at least, uh, we, uh, the chances of an outbreak uh, of an epidemic here are extraordinarily low. Six people have so far been treated for Ebola in the United States. One American man developed symptoms a week or so after coming into contact with an infected person in Liberia. The administration says a travel ban from West Africa is not an option at the moment. Looking to raise global awareness, the World Health Organization announced Monday that although Ebola is not an airborne virus like flu, it can be passed through breast milk and urine. The WHO stressed in particular that the virus can persist in semen for at least 70 days. Ebola can also be transmitted through direct contact with the bodily fluids of an infected person, including blood, sweat and saliva. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. In Hong Kong, formal dialogue between pro-democracy activists and government officials could begin as early as this week, as the crowds of protesters occupying the streets have significantly receded. A second round of preparatory meetings were held by representatives of both sides last night. They reaffirmed that there will be several rounds of negotiations and that both sides will be held on equal footing with the results of the talks to be confirmed and implemented by the government. Now, This comes after student protesters lifted a blockade to government offices on Monday with schools and businesses reopening as well. Last night, more than 1,000 protesters gathered in three locations without incident to continue their call for universal suffrage in Hong Kong's chief executive election slated for 2017. Japan's foreign minister says he will consider removing a comment on the ministry website that says the wartime sexual enslavement was a clear violation of human rights and the dignity of women. Speaking at parliament on Monday, Fumio Kishida said his ministry will soon decide whether to delete or add 
extra commentary. The statement introduces the Asian Women's Fund, which received private donations for the sex slave victims from 1995 to 2007. Now, the minister was responding to a question by an opposition lawmaker who said he didn't believe Japan coerced women to sexual slavery in the early 20th century. Nobel Prize Week has begun, with the first one being awarded in Sweden on Monday. It went to three scientists for uncovering something the Nobel Committee says has occupied the minds of philosophers and scientists for centuries. Park ji reports. The Norwegian husband and wife team of Maybrit Moser and Edvard Moser, together with their British-American colleague John O'Keefe, have been awarded the prestigious Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine for discovering the human brain's GPS system. The discovery of so-called grid cells that become active when trying to map and navigate the outside world explains how the brain knows where we are and is able to guide us from point A to point B. Everyone is here to celebrate with us today. It is absolutely fantastic. What we're interested in is to register small signals, electrical signs from the brain, so that we uncover the mysteries of the brain, such as sense of place and memory. Maybrit Moser's husband and co-researcher Edward was told the news after getting off a flight from Germany. Of course, I'm full of gratitude. It's a great moment. Okif explains the possible ramifications of the team's studies, including how it could ultimately help Alzheimer's patients and stroke victims. Once we understand how uh, an aspect of the world, in this case an aspect of the brain works, uh, we then will start thinking about, well, what goes wrong with that part of the brain? How does it uh, go wrong in, for example, Alzheimer's disease? The trio of scientists will receive 8 million Swedish crowns or some 1.1 million U.S. dollars for broadening our understanding of the human brain's cognitive functions. Park ji Arirang News. The U.S. Supreme Court has allowed the expan expansion of same-sex marriage in America by not ruling on appeals by five states seeking to uphold their bans. The justices let stand lower court rulings that had struck down gay marriage bans in Wisconsin, Indiana, Oklahoma, Utah, and Virginia. While the justices did not offer an explanation for their inaction, it is being viewed as a statement that the Supreme Court does not think it's wrong to allow same-sex couples to marry. The move would clear the way for gay marriage to be legal in 30 states, which is up from 19, plus the District of Columbia. Challenges are pending in the remaining 20 states. Bringing you the fresh updates from stories breaking in Korea and abroad. We give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Join Na Hyung Young live from Seoul every weekday only on Arirang. It's fall, and that usually means there are a countless number of festivals taking place across the nation. If you can't venture too far away from the capital, though, you might want to pay extra attention to this next report as our Son jung in gives us the details about three festivals taking place on the outskirts of Seoul. Producing a thunderous noise, the Black Eagles demonstrate their acrobatic moves crisscrossing in perfect unison. Using the sky as a canvas on which to draw, the aerobatic team glides through the air, sketching different pictures with the white smoke from their tails. The vast sky is filled with planes shooting high into the air and plunging down again. The most interesting maneuvers are the tumbles, where the airplane literally tumbles head over heels, and also the reverse airflow maneuvers, where the airplane goes backwards. Also, the airplane can be flown in knife-edge flight on its side for long periods of time and, of course, inverted. Also in Gyeonggi-do province, the Yeoju Ceramic Festival is in full swing this week in the city of Yeoju. The festival features many ceramic works from various artists as well as a range of hands-on activities such as baking your own pottery creation or smashing them to relieve your stress away. 
And over in the nearby city of Suwon, the Suwon Hwasong Cultural Festival will get underway, inviting local and foreign visitors to Hwasong Fortress, a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site. Visitors can have fun while learning more about Korea's Joseon Dynasty era. There are so many festivals taking place this week in Gyeonggi-do province. We have the air show and the Suwon festival. I hope people take some time to enjoy this splendid weather with their family and friends. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Well, for those of you, those of you who don't want to venture outdoors, here's another list of suggestions. Our Im Yun He has a look at a few plays being staged here in the capital. Instead of heading to the movie theaters this fall, there is always the option of live performances. And at the Suhyunjae Theater, a few familiar faces make an appearance. Veteran actors, usually seen on the TV screen, bring decades of experience to the cast of On Golden Pond. Even though this is the talk of the elderly, anyone can come watch the performance and understand what we're saying. These are everyday sentiments we are talking about. On Golden Pond is a story about an elderly couple who return year after year to the Golden Pond and are joined one year by their daughter and her family. Through their time together, the families bond both on stage and in the audience. Watching, I realized that like the main elderly character, I wanted to live life with no regrets. The play was very meaningful and left me in high spirits. Eventually, children will move on and the only one left will be your spouse. When I go home today, I think I'll be especially grateful for my husband. Sometimes, a slower pace can leave a more lasting impression. The sad play follows the story of a couple with a bleak future ahead, one where they must part forever. But they go through their grief with composure and grace, and most of all love, as they face a challenge together. It's a play that stays true to its name, but also gives the audience a reason to pause and think. A play that uniquely illustrates some of the darker truths of our society, about split families and outcasts. The Invisible Man shows that even though family can be a source of life and strength, it can also be complicated. Nowadays, the idea of a traditional family is something that needs to be addressed. So this play illustrates a real family with real meaning and worth. Even though everything seems at peace, there's always risk. Our society is like that. Even our families are like that, which is what I want to really take to heart. Im Yun Hee, Arirang News. Happy Tuesday, everyone. I'm Kim bo -kyung with your weather updates. Well, if you haven't already, today would be a good idea to take a stroll because we are enjoying another beautiful autumn day nationwide due to a high-pressure system from China. Now, the mercury is rising quickly compared to the morning, but keep in mind that temperatures will drop to the low teens as the night progresses. Also, parts of the Kaewon province as well as parts of the central and southern regions can expect frost early Wednesday morning. We have a national holiday coming up this Thursday, National Hangul Proclamation Day, and some good news that uh, Mother Nature should continue to be on our side. On to the readings. So it's 23 Daegu and Gwangju 24. As for other regions, Daejeon and Jeju reach 22, Dokdo 19, Mount Kumgan 12. That's all the updates for Korea. Tune in for more updates after 6. But before then, let's take a look at the international weather.
That's a wrap from us at this hour. I'll be back on our next newscast at 6 p.m. Korea time. Thank you for watching.